anyway uh yeah my name is leah laser i'm a research associate with the electric school bus initiative at world resources institute and i'll tell you a bit more about what we do um my background is in urban planning with a focus on sustainable transportation planning and i've been doing research on sustainable equitable transportation wri for about five and a half years I don't know what happened um coming to you from dc but i am technically a native new yorker until i was about four years old almost born in a new york cab because they went to the wrong hospital back when that was the thing that you could do <laughs> but uh yeah these days based in dc at wri world resources institute we're a nonprofit, and our partners in think tank that looks to turn research into action, focusing on environment, economy, and human well-being. And within WRI, I am with the Electric School Bus Initiative. So we are trying to build unstoppable momentum to electrify the nearly half a million school buses in the U.S. by 2030. It's a very ambitious target. Um, and within that, we're really focusing on a just and equitable transition. So making sure that underserved communities experience these benefits first and are included in the, the planning and management of the transition process. Um, so why, why have we set ourselves this very ambitious <laughs> target? Uh, there's the number of benefits to electrifying U.S. school buses. Today, we're talking mostly about the health benefits, so we'll go more into details on those, but there's also benefits including you know uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions actually reducing operating expenses for school districts because electricity is often cheaper and more stably priced than diesel helping create new jobs in the automotive manufacturing sector and also being able to use these large electric vehicles as uh, backup power that improves resiliency but to focus more on the health benefits they really all center around the fact that most school buses emit uh, large amounts of diesel exhaust. Um, so it's a it's a known carcinogen. It's been officially classified. It's been linked to asthma, cancer, a lot of respiratory illnesses, um, and children are sus especially susceptible to diesel air pollution, both in terms of health benefits and there's also research showing impacts on um, on educational outcomes, on cognitive performance. That school buses, uh, the the air pollution from school buses, can have negative impacts on students test scores um and these um you know these harms don't happen to everyone equally uh we know that a larger share of low-income students across the country take the bus than uh non-low-income students so 60 percent of low-income students take the bus compared to 45 percent of non-low-income students that take the bus um that's for uh, only middle school and younger and also that more generally uh, ex exposure to particulate matter exhaust from vehicles from on-road sources is higher for people of color than for white people and in terms of asthma rates the the data is, is much worse honestly on childhood asthma rates but we know that native american children are one and a half times as likely to have asthma as non-hispanic white children so there is really an equity angle to this transition so how is it going so far? So there's nearly half a million school buses in the US. Uh, right now, less than 1% of those are electric. Most of them are diesel, some are gasoline. We'll get into the breakdown in a minute. But the transition is, is well underway. Um, so we have electric school bus recline them commitments in 39 states. Um, so what I mean by commitment is the bus has been funded either through a public grant or sometimes just the school budget but it's usually uh, state or federal funding or it's been ordered or delivered or, or put in operation so when we say committed it's not just someone saying like we commit to want to do this that this is a a higher threshold than that so nearly thirteen thousand electric school buses have been committed across 39 states and we're seeing that grow like basically monthly um Little shout out to our, our data set that tracks this in real time <laughs> that is linked in the event description. Um, and as I said, more electrification pledges are on the way with New York City having one of the most ambitious, which is why we're here today. Um, so next is the part where we start going into the New York data because this is New York Open Data Week, but I wanted to pause first and see if there's any questions on any of that um, or to hear if there's anything in particular that that someone is really excited to hear more about or discuss about so that we can focus on that moving forward. Feel free to, to come off mute 
or raise your hand if you prefer. All right. Oh, got a question in the chat. So it's all right if I read that out. Eric Richardson from DCIS Fleet says, can you talk a little bit about how delays in production and delivery affects these commitments that we were seeing for EV school buses? Yep. There's also a question, who manages school buses under what jurisdiction do they say? Okay, great. Um, I will take, I think, Jennifer's question first, because it's a little simpler. Um, so school transportation is almost always handled at the school district level. Um, so school districts either own and operate their own buses, or sometimes they contract with private operators. So the operator you know, owns and, and operates the bus on behalf of the school. Um, so both models are pretty prevalent. We think about 40% of US school buses are owned by private operators and the rest are by school districts. Um, so that's who manages the direct school transportation, the vehicles, the routes, the, the fleet management procurement. But there is a, a lot of different state level regulation that sort of oversees that. So it's state level policy regarding, um, especially regarding safety. Do they need to have seat belts? Do they need to have certain accessibility requirements? Um, some states like Maryland has a cap on how old the buses are allowed to be, um, which side note is posing problems for repowers because you can actually take a diesel bus and retrofit it to be electric. But according to Maryland, it's the same bus on the same age timeline. It doesn't start over when you were power. So that's a different problem. Um, yeah, so that's that. So there are. Um, hey, Leo, we have a hand raised from Lupe. Would yeah. you like to unmute you, Lupe? Thank you. Um, I was trying to write it in the chat, but <laughs> <laughs> um, one, I was going to say um, our concerns with what you're going to present in regards to New York City transitioning to um, electric school buses is that um, we are seeing that it is a phase in of till 2035 mm -hmm. um, and that um, OPT, and I will say for New York City, unfortunately, school districts and schools are not running the school bus companies. They are privately owned through the Office of Pupil Transportation mm -hmm. um, that has many, many vendors and companies um, with zero oversight from the Department of Education or New York City Public Schools, as we are calling it now, um, which causes a lot of these contracts to and millions of dollars of contracts to be spent on a service that is not safe um, or great quality for our students and especially our students with disabilities so that was going to be my concern as far as when we're talking about the, the buses coming in um, mm -hmm. because in New York City we even had many instances over the summer where kids were on bus hot buses for hours and hours our routes are two to four hours daily each way our yeah. students are not getting to school till after school has already begun missing many supports and um so beyond even just this problem but mm -hmm. how this phase in will impact our most vulnerable students here in new york city was um in going forward with your presentation <laughs> And thank you for being here. Yeah. We appreciate you and all the data you're providing for us. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. It's a great question. It's a, it's a really important point. There's a lot of, you said a lot of equity concerns aside from the the air pollution, you know, the students that are, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not the New York City expert, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is the students that are typically traveling on the longer routes are the ones that are going to charter schools, not neighborhood schools. So they might be ones that, you know, the, the local school wasn't meeting their needs for whatever reason, which is probably more likely in lower income areas. And so those students are the ones that are seeing these really long, uncomfortable bus rides and breathing in even more pollution. So there's a lot of sort of layers of impact there. Um, and I guess one of the other things I was, I was hearing in your question is, um, yeah, like how, like what's the kind the oversight and enforcement of private operators that are serving public school students. Um, please correct me if I misunderstood, but yeah, that's it's a really, really important point and one that I don't personally have a great answer to, but maybe you do. Maybe we can chat more about it towards the end. Um, all right. So Eric, had his, we answered the question about the repowers. Um, and Eric yeah, had a question about delays in production and delivery, and maybe we'll get into that more 
at the end because uh, I want to make sure we do get into our, our data portion, but please keep the questions coming and, and we can revisit soon. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. We've got lots of nice, colorful charts. Um, some context for this is that our, our project took on a, a very massive open data exercise. Basically, there was no um, comprehensive publicly available data set of school bus fleets uh, for the whole country. There were a, a couple that you could get if you were willing to pay like $60,000. And even then, yeah, <laughs> so it's really for, for private sector, you know, not for advocates, not for, for school district employees. Um, but even then, the the finest level of geographic disaggregation those data sets usually included were either uh, usually county, sometimes zip code, um, and school district boundaries overlap in all kinds of wonky ways with counties and zip codes. So basically, from those data sets, there was no data, no way to tell what school district those buses were serving, and no way to correlate it with any equity related data because there's really excellent data of all kinds about students in each school district and it's all at the school district level from the National Center for Education Statistics. So basically we needed to be able to figure out which district the buses were serving in order to both be able to, to target and support those districts and understand the equity impacts of the transition. Um, so after a lot of digging, we sort of came to discover that the the best source for this data is usually at the state level. Um, some state agency usually has some data set on school bus fleets. It's most often the Department of Education. Uh, sometimes it's the Department of Transportation. And in New York, it was um, Department of Transportation. It's also sometimes the like state police or some or equivalent because they often handle um, inspect like safety inspections of vehicles. So sometimes the base, best data we could get was like the Michigan State Police Safety Inspection records. Um, but all that said, so we FOIAed every state multiple times over nine months, and we created this data set of, of school bus fleets, um, which can be disaggregated to the district level and includes a lot of different variables. The most important ones for this use case are um, fuel type and age and bus size or type. Um, and then there's a lot of other information about manufacturer and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Take a look. Um, and so I wanted to give you first a national level snapshot. And so you can see how that compares to the New York State and New York City level data that we'll get into. Um, so these charts are looking at the fleet, uh, the sort of the nation, nationwide fleet, all the school buses in the country disaggregated by fuel type. Um, so one of the first things I, I learned in this project is there are way more fuel types than I realized. We identified like 10, and that was even when we aggregated some, like the different kinds of hybrids. Um, so the main thing to know is they, all of these besides electric are primarily fossil fuels, and they're in different formulations and have different emissions impacts. But um, basically everything, but the electric sliver, which is too small to see, is is a fossil fuel and does have significant climate and health emissions. Um, so looking across the whole country, this light blue sliver is the largest. Um, can you see my cursor when I'm hovering on it? Great. All right. So light blue is diesel, dark blue is gasoline. This big orange one here is the ones where we didn't know the fuel types. The state didn't provide that data. And then we have a lot of little little slivers. Um, so then this chart on the right, I took out the buses where we don't know the fuel type. We're making an assumption here that the buses where we don't know the fuel type are have roughly the same distribution as, as the rest of the buses in the country. The overwhelming majority are, are diesel with a, a smaller share or gasoline. Um, so that's just for some context. So bringing it back to New York, and then we'll look at a similar set of charts for New York. Um, on New York State School Transportation, we think that about 2.3 million students ride the bus in New York State, that there's 42 to 46,000 buses. Um, it may be the largest fleet in the country. Texas might have more buses. It's surprisingly hard to tell, um, but it's it's a it's a really large number. It's 10% of the students in the country. And um, data from the American Lung Association in New York estimates that moving from diesel to clean transportation will result in a significant a number of avoided asthma attacks and also uh, public health savings. 
So for that reason, there is a target to electrify all school buses in New York State by 2035. And that uh, New York City has reaffirmed that pledge. And I've also heard that they're aiming ideally for 2030, but I don't know the details of that. Maybe some of you do. Um, so there is public funding and support for that transition from a number of sources. One of the biggest ones is NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. I think we might have some NYSERDA folks with us today. Um, and then there's a number of federal programs that New York buses are eligible for, including the Clean School Bus Program from the EPA. Um, so here's a little bit about our open data efforts in, in New York State specifically. As I said, it turns out the Department of Transportation had the records in this case. So they sent us a spreadsheet that looked, looked like this. They actually sent it as a PDF. We had to convert it. Why would they send a PDF of a spreadsheet? It's okay. <laughs> Um, so they were tracking for about 46,000 buses owned by over 1,200 operators. And you can see just from glancing through those operator names that they're not all public school districts. A lot of them in New York State were private fleet operators of a, of a general variety. Some of them seem to be associated with specific um, like focuses, like they were doing um, Head Start transportation or transportation for students with mobility impairments. Um, a number of them were specifically for um, different kinds of private schools, a lot of uh, like Hebrew names of uh, fleet operator companies. Um, yeah, so they sent us basically everything we wanted to know, operator name, fuel type, year, manufacturer, seating capacity, and vehicle type. And so this is the data that the rest of what I'm about to show you is based on. So it's New York State level data about New York City. Um, this project didn't include trying to get this from, from New York City specifically. Uh, but oh. And then the other important piece of context, so I'm going to be talking about type A and type C or D buses. All you really need to know is type A are the smaller mini buses, 10 to 15 passengers, and type C are the big buses. They're the ones with the with the noses that stick out. Um, great. So here's that same set of charts, but for New York State. Um, so one thing you'll see is that there's a smaller range of fuel types in New York State than in the country in general. There's, um, but still, again, a significant majority of diesel buses and then a lot of gasoline buses, actually more than we had seen in most other states. But if you look on the right, and I'm sorry, this is not the most clear, but this is where our bus types come into play. You'll see that the, the really big majority of the diesel buses are type C, are the big buses. Whereas this big sliver over here of the, of the gasoline buses are type A buses, so smaller ones. Basically, most of the gasoline buses are smaller buses. Most of the diesel buses are the, the big ones. So that's important because in terms of the total number of students that are riding on these buses, it's mostly it's mostly diesel. These um, Type C buses carry, you know, often four times as many students. So we'll get into more about what that means shortly. Um, this is the same data shown a different way because we all have different kinds of visual brains, and I'm still learning how to present this. But on the left here, each column is a fuel type, and then it's broken out by a bus type. So you can see of all the diesel buses. A small purple sliver are type A small buses, and a large majority are yellow type C buses. And then it's reversed oh, for gasoline. And then on the right here, it's broken out where each column is a bus type, and then those columns are disaggregated by fuel types. So I can I can come back to this if there's questions. I just know we all process information differently. Um, and now we'll move to New York City specifically. Um, and yet would be very happy for audience participation here. Again, I did have some background knowledge and I did some research, but I'm not an expert on New York City school transportation. So I can learn from all of you as well. Um, one important thing to note is that New York City is a little bit unusual and that the district does not own or operate the buses directly. There's a nonprofit called Nice Bus, the New York School Bus Umbrella Services, that is a nonprofit that was created to own and operate the fleet. And there's many other players in this ecosystem. You'll see on the right here, I pulled that from their website. There's a number of different advocacy groups that are working to improve student transportation in different ways, as Lupe alluded to. 
and then a variety of public agencies that are that are also involved. Um, and then one big caveat looking ahead is that according to the various sources on the internet, there are apparently 10 to 14,000 school buses in New York City. But according to both that state data that we got, and then also I cross-checked with some of our partners at NYSERDA last week, it, we only found about a thousand school buses in New York City. So I don't, I don't know what's going on there. If like someone added an extra zero to the 10,000 bus estimate, or if there's a really high number that are owned and operated by entities other than the nice bus, um, that's a really big question mark, <laughs> but let's look at the fleet. So uh, New, York City, New York City public school bus fleet by a fuel type and bus type. And these are all the buses that we found in that New York DOT data set that we could tell were, were serving New York City. So it looks pretty similar to the breakdown by state. Um, there's a lot more type A than type C buses. So a lot of the fleet is those smaller buses. Um, and most of those smaller buses are powered by by gasoline. Um, there's no legend here, but still, dark blue is gasoline, light blue is diesel. And then again, there's uh, a smaller but significant number of type C buses, of which the majority are, are diesel. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to look at was the age of the school buses, because there um, is a definite correlation between the age of the bus and the amount and type of air pollution that it emits. Basically, newer buses, even if they're diesel buses, have much lower uh, emissions of most air pollutants. So that's been due somewhat to technology improvement, but there's also there's a step change represented by this black line here, um, where the uh, federal sort of requirements regarding diesel emissions went into effect. So we know that any diesel buses after 2010 uh, had to comply with these improved regulations. Some buses that are, are earlier from 2009 and 2008 might have also complied with the regulations because it was on a fleet basis, but we don't really know. So we're assuming for the purposes of this, basically that buses 2009 or older have, have higher emissions. Um, and the other important thing to keep in mind is that buses lifespans are about 15 years long. Um, so this is the age of all the New York City school buses, but they were very different trends by bus type. So these are type A buses. What I really wanted to show you is this. Um, these are the type C or D buses in New York City. And there's a, a very striking trend um, where a large majority of these are from 2015. Um, and that is important because as we just learned, that buses have about a 15 year lifespan. Uh, so it means that a large percentage of the biggest and therefore higher emitting buses in New York City will reach the end of their lifespan around 2030. Um, so again, this is caveated by the fact that we have not been able to track down many thousands of buses that are purportedly operating in New York City. But from what we do know, this is this is really important information because being able to meet those transition targets will mean being ready for 2030 when most of these buses are, are being retired and replacements are being procured and having all the infrastructure in place to make sure those are replaced with electric school buses. Um, the other sort of action relevant thing I wanted to point out was the like inconsistency in number of buses that were procured each year. So this is model year, not year they were purchased, but there's there's usually a correlation. So some years they buy, you know, 6% of the fleet and some years it's more like 20%. And there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of homogeneity as you'll see here. And I'm not sure why, but I think for folks that are looking to sort of get ahead of things and support a transition, it would be important to figure out what, what is driving that um, and prepare appropriately so that you can have campaigns or infrastructure or strategy in place for when a larger procurement is coming up. Um, Great. The other thing I wanted to touch on before we move to conclusions and discussions is um, another set of stakeholders that are impacted by school bus air pollution. So we've been talking mostly about students who are riding the bus, and, and we think that those are the folks that are most 
impacted by the pollution from the buses. Um, but you know, these buses go home at night and park in a depot. And so that means every day they turn on all in one place. They're maybe they're idling, they're heating up, they're being serviced, they're all driving out in a line from a depot that is probably next to something. Um, probably, you know, in some cases, probably next to, you know, homes or playgrounds or schools. Um, so it's really important to think about where these, especially these, the oldest, dirtiest, biggest buses are being parked and who is affected by that. And I think that it's another really important lens to think about when planning an equitable transition is which depots to electrify first. Um, and, you know, there's many other considerations there, including the, you know, electricity infrastructure in the area, do, to making sure they want to sort of double down on that as a depot location for the future, et cetera. But um, yeah, it is important to keep in mind school bus depots as point source pollution, as well as school buses as on-road mobile pollution. And this is a great map from the New York League of Conservation Voters, the New York City Clean School Bus Coalition, building on data from New York lawyers for public interest. And so it maps school bus depots um, on top of concentration of air pollution and different equity variables. I, I encourage you to check it out. Um, a little bit about how the transition to electric school buses is going in New York City. As we said, there's a commitment to electrify all the buses by 2035. So the ambitious goal and the political will is definitely in place, which is, is not to be taken for granted. It's not the case everywhere. Um, in terms of our tracking of of committed ESBs, again, that's funded, uh, ordered, delivered, or operating, not just committed in a conceptual sense. Um, so based on that definition of committed, we are tracking 118. So of those 107 are in the awarded or funded phase, eight have been ordered, two have been delivered, one is operating. If someone on this call has more updated data, please tell us. Um, that includes 25 buses that were recently awarded from the EPA's Clean School Bus Program, as well as a large grant from NYSERDA um, to, to procure buses and also to set up the infrastructure to support them. So um, I know this presentation was had how as the first word, how can open data support this transition? Um, so to sum things up, I know our goal is to reduce children's exposure to diesel exhaust, which means reducing their time spent on big pre-2010 diesel buses. And we also have the goal of an all electric fleet by 2035. So to help us reach those targets, we know that New York City has uh, a number of, uh, a majority actually of smaller gasoline powered buses, which I think are not necessarily the focus for our efforts at first. They're smaller and they're running on a slightly cleaner fuel. The focus really is the big type C diesel buses, a lot of which are from 2015. Um, and given that, that clumpiness and the large variation in annual procurement, I think a major way to act on this data is to rally around that. I mean, first confirm that um, and then sort of plan, plan around that and be ready for when the larger procurements are coming. And then there's also a lot of things we don't know. Um, as I said, all the other school buses and their operators, I think it's important to know more about who rides the bus, um, both in terms of socioeconomic characteristics like race and income, also what neighborhoods because that's correlated with ambient air pollution. And also the, the age, are we talking mostly the younger children, probably our older children more likely to take public transport or walk. So who is really being impacted by the, by the pollution and by the benefits? And then, as I said, who, yeah, the focus more on the, the people not on the bus, people on the routes and near the depots. So that includes people living near the de depots and also, um, the, the staff who drive the bus sit on the bus all day, who work in the bus yard. And if you've been around there, are often walking around with handkerchiefs on their mouth because they know they, they breeze this stuff on all day. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then also in terms of planning and being able to hold people with purchasing power responsible or to support them, we, we'd like to know when when our large procurements and retirements being planned. Um, yeah, so that's all had planned in terms of slides. Um, thank you, Rob, for your claps. <laughs> but yeah, would love to 
hear from you all. If anyone has any corrections, which I bet you do, please tell us. I'm going to look at the chat, um, but would also encourage folks to come off mute and share any reflections uh, or questions. So let's open it up. Yes. Okay, Rajas, I'm going to unmute. We got some very important information from Eric Richardson. Thank you. He said um, there's 40 vendors for NYC school bus contracts. So they have the rest of the 10,000 buses. Nice bus has 1,000. Uh, so that's very helpful. Okay. Mention multiple FOIA requests. Um, mostly because we didn't, so that Ryan asked um, basically why we were sending multiple requests. Mostly because we didn't know who had the data. So within each state, mostly there's not one statewide FOIA request process. Each agency in the state has their own separate FOIA request. Um, and it often was not clear which agency had this data. So I would often just FOIA all at once, separate request to the Department of Education and Transportation and anything else that looked promising um, and see which one yielded fruit. Um, and also agencies often didn't know which other agency did. I can't tell you how many times like the Department of Transportation wrote back and was like, we don't have this and no one in the state does, sorry, too bad. And the next day I'd get an email from the Department of Education being like, here you go. <laughs> um, so it definitely takes some persistence. Um, and then Luke, uh, said, given that the aim is to reduce children's exposure to exhaust and the long timeline for swap over. Yeah, and just in exploring short term ways to reduce today's exposure to exhaust. Um, HEPA filters, clean truck programs. Yeah, so from what I read related to school buses specifically, some of the best ways to do that are anti-idling laws. Um, don't let the buses idle at school districts. Um, and then there's also, ways to manage the opening or closing of windows that can help with the indoor air quality. Um, so often these are like operational, not technological <laughs> solutions. Like if you're idling in traffic, keep the windows closed. If you're driving in a place where you are getting better ventilation, you want to have the windows open. But those can often be hard to, to implement since the drivers are already very overworked. And what is the likelihood of getting a bus full of third graders to close their windows when you tell them to? Um, but I think anti-idling laws um, have been proven to be really effective when enforced, even more so than than filters, things like that. Um, what can be done to push for retrofitting? Oh man, lots of good questions. Okay, hold on. Um, and then to push for retrofitting, that's more of a question for for some of my colleagues. Honestly, I think um, some of it has to do with figuring out which better data on the process, figuring out where in a bus's life cycle it makes sense to retrofit, because if it's very close to the end of its life in terms of the sort of everything besides the engine is like pretty run down, and then you retrofit the engine from diesel to electric, and then the rest of the bus conks out after three years, it wasn't worth the investment to retrofit and repower. Um, so that's a question. Let's see. And then Eric asked, Aside from public health savings, are there other quantifiable savings from this transition? Electricity costs versus gasoline, better repair maintenance, longer usable life. Yeah, uh, really good question. Um, so one of the main benefits we're we're hearing is probably that they're like much they're like better for student behavior. This is a little bit of an aside, but they're much quieter. The students don't have to yell to talk to each other, and when they're not yelling, they like. Are more relaxed, the bus drivers are better able to manage the bus. We're hearing that bus drivers really like it for that reason. Um, yeah, in terms of cost, it's it's tricky because it's a much higher upfront cost with electric buses to install infrastructure and procure the bus, but then the operational costs are often lower. They're easy to maintain because there's fewer moving parts. Um, and also the cost of electricity tends to be much more stable than the the cost of gasoline or diesel. So regardless of the relative prices, which in most states electricity is cheaper than than diesel, but even separate from the relative price, we're hearing the school districts really love the like certainty of being able to more accurately project their fuel costs into the future. Um, yeah, let's see. And then I asked if I had to FOIA did some agencies volunteer data. Um, I basically FOIA'd rather than asking because then if I like the few ones I did kind of just ask, they often asked me to FOIA them and it just was an easier process to FOIA everybody and 
uh, they they seem to be agreeable with that. I think five states published this, but not that many had it publicly available. Um, more questions. Jennifer is asking, I assume this issue is primarily in urban areas. This compound is another issue with buses in general is traffic and idling. The idling increases its emissions. Can you talk about the policy implications? Um, Jennifer, can you clarify the policy implications of this being a primarily urban issue or the policy implications of idling or? Am I unmuted? Yes. Great. Um, hey, thanks for that presentation. Now, I was just assuming, you know, if we're looking at buses writ large at this bus for school districts writ large, that there's probably different issues in urban areas versus rural areas. And I'm assuming what this presentation was focusing on, since it looked at New York City, was specifically in urban areas. Um, I think you addressed my um, issue about idling um, in a previous question um, that a lot of it had to do with enforcement. Um, but I didn't know if there were any other um, implications or um, policies that you've seen that have been successful in place um, to address some of the stuff in the interim while buses become electric. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. It's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, this talk, I was trying to focus sort of on the, the urban use case with New York, but actually across the country, it's suburban areas that have the most total number of school buses. Um, I think it's partly because in urban areas, there's a larger share of students using public transportation or walking. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also there's different electrification challenges and in, in different types of locales. Um, yeah, I mean, in urban areas, finding sort of space for a depot is often an issue. And there's more concern about sort of ambient air pollution versus in, in rural areas, there's more of a challenge often about um, some of the drivers take the buses home at night. There aren't always depots, or if there are depots, there's maybe three or five buses there. And so the the cost of the infrastructure relative to the number of buses that are using it is much higher. So that can have economic challenges. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Okay, and then Dimitri is sharing some questions from Regis. Can a driver of a gas diesel have a license that can be used on an EV? Um, so school bus drivers in general need a commercial driver's license. Um, so it's the same license you use to drive a, a city bus or a truck. And then there's a special school bus endorsement within that. Um, the You don't need a different license to drive an electric bus, but sort of informally outside of licensing, um, drivers do get additional training on how to operate the electric bus. It's, it's mostly the same. It's mostly, <laughs> from what we're hearing, more pleasant. Um, but there's a few smaller things. There's different indicators you need to monitor. You need to get used to looking at battery life. And then um, there's often different protocols for, for parking. And sometimes the drivers are plugging them in or not. Um, but it's the same, it's the same license. Um, and how do school bus emissions compare to metro bus emissions on a percent total? Honestly, in New York, I have no idea. Um, more places have school buses than have metro buses. Um, there's more, I believe, more school buses in the country than public transit buses, um, which is part of why our initiative is focusing on them. But I, I don't have good data for you for New York. I'm sorry. Um, Lupe, thank you. Yes, when I want up Lupe's comment, feel free to come off the chat, for, or to come off mute and, and speak out loud. You don't have to hop in the chat. But Lupe was saying that school bus in New York are predominantly in areas that are impacted environmentally, and it's definitely a health justice issue just wanted to to one up that but I don't know how much you can see this map but in general the darker areas are the more impacted areas and you can see those buses clustered um you know down here up here yeah it's, and that's typical across the country um let's see I see is anti-ailing laws for commercial vehicles great okay so a question <laughs> from Mishnu about shifting student military to public transit instead of private buses. I mean, yeah, from a purely climate perspective, the, the total fewer vehicles in use, the better. So if theoretically, if the same number of students could be transported on, on an existing fleet of public transit vehicles or subways and you wouldn't need the school buses, that would theoretically be, be a climate win. Um, but there's you know, a lot of, of benefits to the school transportation system. The main one is safety. And, you know, the school bus system members primarily 
for student safety. Um, they're built like tanks and they're very sort of contained environments compared to the subway. So I think a lot of the the benefit of the separate school bus system is sort of peace of mind for the parents who can put their kids on the bus and be able to go to work, whereas a lot of younger students would need to be accompanied on, on foot or public transit. So there's there's definitely trade-offs, you know, on one hand, it would be great if we didn't need another fleet of large vehicles. On the other hand, being able to get students to, to school safely without parents being directly involved frees up a lot of people to be able to go to work or to use their private vehicles for other uses. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Oh, and then we've got a question from M Mulate. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Go ahead. Hi, sorry. That's my last name on here, on there. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you first for this presentation. And as I look at the maps that you have up, um, those clusters that are, uh, you know, darker in shade, they happen to be also where black and brown folks are living. And there's an economic racial aspect to this. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could uh, speak to uh, the, how the decisions that we make um, whether it's with schools or other um, policy policies, um, how those end up having a disproportional effect and impact on poorer communities, communities of color, um, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so this is something that's definitely not specific to school bus depots, as many of you know, school bus depots are what we call a sort of a locally undesirable land use. It's a thing that most people, if given the choice, wouldn't want to live near. Uh, so other examples include dumps or industrial facilities that make you know smelly emissions, things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of structural sort of longstanding reasons why those land uses tend to be located in, in disadvantaged communities. So predominantly communities of color, low-income communities, um, a lot of it, I think, has to do with sort of political power. They often have less access to elected officials or sort of less ability to engage in civic life, sometimes due to language barriers or, or busy work schedules, um, and end up not being able to, to fight back as hard as more privileged communities to prevent those land uses from coming to those areas. Um, you know, notwithstanding the incredible organizing and advocacy that's coming out of communities of color and low-income communities all across the country and, and New York. Um, I think some of it also has to do with um, sort of the landscape of land uses more generally and real estate values. You know, these are, are large facilities. You need to be able to park maybe a dozen school buses. So they tend to be more in sort of the outskirts. It might be less built up areas, areas where property values are a little bit lower so they can buy a larger plot. Um, and then the the people who are also tending to live in you know, the areas with more affordable housing because of lower property values are also, as that makes sense, as, you know, lower income folks or, or people of color. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's it's not a school bus issue in particular, but it's sort of a something that's playing out very clearly with, with school bus depots as well. Um, yeah. In terms of what can be done about it, I mean, I think you know, districts and operators will be making decisions about what depots to prioritize for electrification. And I'm sure they'll be thinking of different operational questions, like what routes do they want the buses to run on? Where is there a substation that can provide enough electricity? But I think there's a real opportunity to, to sort of engage and pressure those decision makers and make sure that equity considerations and health justice and environmental justice are also factors in, in deciding which depots to prioritize for electrification. Or maybe which depots to to shut down, or where to situate a new depot. Um, yeah, does that does that speak to what you were? Getting at? Yeah. All right. Have I missed any other chats? Um, so Luke says, from the cost perspective, they could even sol install solar panels on bus roofs so they can con contribute to a charging array and further reduce the cost between shifts. Lots of scope for innovation with Con Edison. Um, using fleet batteries to support the grid. I have never heard of a bus with solar panels on the roof of the bus. Is that what you meant? I've heard of solar panels at the depot <laughs> location. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I was just like, I'm just doodling around with this. It looks yeah. like somebody is already doing it. They, they've already created a kit to put onto buses mm. that allow, you know, that essentially put solar panels on top. It just seems like a lot of real <laughs> estate. Um, and the buses, I think, if I understand correctly, they're, they're idle for some parts of the day when the sun mm. is brightest. So why not have them contributing to a grid? Um, and then if it's in those areas where maybe power isn't always so reliable, then that, that those batteries can then serve as a, as a can actually feed back into the grid overnight um, and yeah. support local local communities with um, with you know particularly during the off hours when it's not sunny and you know support the grid locally so there's lots of innovation that could be done there I'm sure with you know partnering with Con Edison um, and just taking a slightly less bureaucratic view um, and I'd imagine you know procurement would need to get involved um, and, and in terms of what are the specifications for buses I think you know, working with vendors to say that we want to mandate, we want to mandate sensible use of roof space so that it actually does incorporate, you know, uh, solar panels because the solar the price of solar panels have come down significantly in recent years. So these are just things that I think with the scale you're talking about, maybe WRI can be pushing for this in some of their, in some of their research and uh, activities. Over. Yeah, no, it's great. I love the, the thinking and thank you for that, that link. What a fun picture. Um, yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely doing some work on um, vehicle to grid and also manage charging, which I think is what you're getting at. So the uh, sort of dumb charging model is you plug in a bus, you plug yeah. in anything, and it charges as quickly yeah. as possible until it's full. But there's a lot of opportunities with with managed charging to make sure that the, the buses are drawing electricity either when it's cheapest and save money yeah. for the school yeah. or at times of day when um, the most renewable energy is being produced like during the day since as you said sometimes um yeah. the buses are idle during the day although i i would guess in new york city they're probably doing like consecutive routes most of the day um and that might be more of a factor in in other districts with um you know fewer fewer yeah. schools or students um yeah there's also talk about um possible uses for old uh electric school bus batteries so you know the the battery has a, a certain lifespan towards the end of its lifespan it yeah. wouldn't have enough capacity for the bus to actually run on but it still could be used for other other things so there's some utility yeah. pilots where the school owns the bus but the ut utility owns the bus battery and at a certain point the utility will basically take back the battery take ownership of the battery and integrate it into some sort of energy storage facility um to help yeah. you know manage the, the mismatch between when renewable energy is produced and when it's needed, they often need these big banks of batteries and yeah. it's a great use for older batteries that shouldn't really be on the road, but still have a lot of life that you can squeeze from all the, you know, critical minerals that went into producing them. Um, yeah, absolutely. 